Greetings once more, and welcome back to our continuing examination of geocentrism. In the last part, we continued looking at the Sky Fairy Conjecture hey. by considering the population of asteroids in the solar system. We saw how achondrites, stony iron and iron meteorites are the result of collisions involving differentiated bodies, and that chondrites contain primitive material that hasn't endured high temperatures or differentiation. We found copious amounts of builder's rubble had been left lying around, unfinished moons of Mars, evidence of sky fairy gambling in the form of Earth-crossing asteroids, and the possibility that Mr. Space Hammer Man has additional duties. Most importantly, we found that our solar system had to have formed from material formed by one or more earlier stars, that reality simply doesn't match creationist accounts, and that both the sky fairy conjecture and geocentrism which relies on it were quite obviously bollocks. Although we've been dealing with geocentrism as a general topic throughout the series, in this part we'll start looking at something specific. A curious halfway house put forward by Tuco Brahe, who we met in part 6. We saw how, predating the invention of the telescope, Brahe was unable to measure parallax for the supernova of 1572, or for any star that he attempted. It would take until 1838 for parallax to be measured for the first time by Friedrich Bessel. Brahe also thought that stars were about one arc minute in size. What he didn't know is that one arc minute is a typical resolution of the human eye. Again, he was limited by the precision available to him, and his conclusion was flawed as a result. Any point light source would never appear smaller than that to him, only dimmer. Like other astronomers of the time, Brahe was unaware that stars vary in their luminosity, and so, based on the assumption that dimmer stars must be further away, he concluded that the dimmer and apparently more distant stars would have to be physically larger in order to appear about the same size to the eye. It's a sensible progression of thinking based on the information he had available, but a quick look at the sky with magnification shows it's wrong, as stars invisible to the naked eye are made visible. Brahe's ideas on stars, plus the idea that Earth was simply too heavy to move, and his religious beliefs led him to believe that although the other planets clearly orbited the Sun, Earth was still somehow fixed in place. Incomplete data combined with an adherence to ancient texts leads to invalid conclusions. As soon as you want to fix the Earth or anything else in place, you need some extraordinary physics. Let's look at the implication of Brahe's model and see how it fares. He believed space was made of a light, highly strong stuff called ether or quintessence. This stuff was supposed to hold everything in place, and its natural motion was circular. No trace of it has ever been found, contrary to the claims of the most mendacious geocentrists. If we look at a depiction of Brahe's model, we spot a problem right away. He has the stars circling Earth, just like the Ptolemaic model. This, of course, provides no scope for stellar parallax to occur. As we saw in Part 6, parallax is due to the motion of the observer. If the observer isn't moving, then quite simply everything he observes must move in order to create an illusion of parallax due to his motion. In Brahe's universe then, just like Ptolemy's, the stars must move back and forth through this highly strong quintessence stuff. The back and forth motion of each star must be configured according to its right ascension, so that throughout a year, the changes are perfectly concordant with Earth orbiting the Sun. Here then we have Brahe version 1.1. Hmm. We know from part 7 that moving from side to side to mimic parallax isn't going to be enough though. Brahe's universe also needs to produce an annual variation in the Doppler shift of the stars. They must also move toward and away from Earth in a yearly cycle. Combine the two, and as we saw, each star and object outside our solar system must move in a near circular ellipse with a major axis of 300 million kilometers. The plane of each star's ellipse must also be parallel to the ecliptic plane. So now we've upgraded Brahe 1.1 to version 1.2. Hmm. Why would stars, which we know vary in mass, all move in ellipses of the same size like this? What force moves each and every star in their annual ellipse around absolutely nothing, whilst they also circle Earth every day? We have four options. The weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force. Electromagnetism. Gravity. Stop. Have a time. 
Could it be Mr. Space Hammerman and his clone army supplying Brahe 1.2 with both annual Doppler and Parallax variations? That would be silly. Obviously, it's a conspiracy by the Sky Fairy. Why? Well, to test our faith, of course. You can't touch this. Even though everything about the universe says, I wasn't made by a Sky Fairy, you are supposed to believe that it says exactly the opposite. Regardless of the driving force behind the annual ellipses of Brahe 1.2, we also seen that stars have velocities of their own through space. They are simply not the fixed points of light that people imagined hundreds of years ago. The space velocity of each star is another layer of motion that must be added to the annual ellipse that every star undertakes as part of the Sky Fairy's Moving Earth Deception slash Faith Test. Consider Barnard's star. We've seen that it has a velocity tangential to our line of sight of 89.8 km per second. That motion is at 85.58 degrees from the horizontal of the celestial sphere. We also worked out its radial velocity, 107 km per second towards us, and combined the two to get its space velocity of 140 km per second. Since we know the plane of the triangle represented by the tangential and radial velocities, we know the direction of motion of Barnard's star relative to us. Ah, but it's also moving in its geocentric annual ellipse, parallel to the ecliptic. For Barnard's star, that's near enough parallel to the celestial equator for our purposes. Imagine we stick a camera in space that circles Earth with Barnard's star every day, so that we can isolate and see its annual motion. When we add the space velocity to this motion, we find that Barnard's star would describe a skewed helix through space. With a space velocity of 140 km per second, the star moves 4.4 billion kilometers in that direction each year, and that is the pitch of its helix through space. All this just to simulate the combined effects of parallax, annual Doppler shift, and its own apparent velocity. If you think that's looking nutty, remember that every star and galaxy is moving through space and has to have an annual ellipse parallel to the ecliptic plane, so they're all moving in variously skewed helices in different directions, and since they're all moving at different speeds, the pitch of each object's helix is different too. Ptolemy's model was obviously crap. Brian took the original Everything Circles Earth and turned it into Everything Circles Earth apart from the things that orbit the Sun, forming a bastard child of geocentrism. Trying to shoehorn explanations for these subsequent observations into Brahe's universe now results in something even more outlandish. Brahe version 1.3, the crazy helix universe. Does it survive a shave with Occam's razor? No, this Tuconian model of geocentrism is bollocks. Let's not abandon it just yet, though. Can we make it simpler and better? Let's give it a spin, no pun intended. If we look at the sky at the same time every night, say midnight, we see that the stars change apparent position, moving westward by roughly one degree per day. In reality, this is because Earth orbits the barycenter of the solar system, and so each midnight you're looking into space in a slightly different direction. Simple. If we leave Brahe's stars circling Earth in the Ptolemaic style, they must mimic this, and so the stars must circle Earth at a slightly different rate to the Sun, so that each day there's that one degree or so difference. That just makes his universe even more complicated. However, we can solve that problem, and the annual Doppler and Parallax problems, with one simple change. If we totally abandon any hint of Ptolemy and move the stars so that they are centred on the Sun, we can rotate the whole lot around Earth once a day. If we then rotate the stars around the Sun once a year, then the Sun moves around the ecliptic each year, and we see drift in the stars each night. It also then gives rise to the annual parallax and Doppler shift cycles as the stars change their apparent position and their distance from Earth. Things are looking up for the geocentrists. It gets better. By centering the entire universe on the Sun, then the surface of last scattering, the source of the CMB, is also centred on the Sun. This would produce an annual Doppler variation in the CMB radiation too. It's another observation in the bag for geocentrists. Could this fresh, new Brahe version 2.0 be the solution? Whoa, not so fast. It wouldn't explain why one half of the CMB is detectably warmer than the other, with a gradation that shows that Earth and the entire galaxy are moving, as we saw in Part 8. 
The CMB does, after all, provide the closest thing we have to an absolute frame of reference. So when the oldest observable radiation in the universe says we're moving, we're moving. Many geocentrists object to the idea of Earth moving because they seem to think that Earth can't move through space at the 29.8 kilometers per second needed to complete an orbit of the Sun once a year. Adherents to the Tuconian flavor of geocentrism, though, appear to have no difficulty in accepting that everything else in the solar system can move at comparable speeds to undergo their journeys around the Sun. <laughs> Consider, though, Brahe 2.0, in which the universe circles the Sun once a year. Let's show that with a polar grid, and let's stick in a couple of constellations so that we have our bearings. At midnight of the December solstice, Orion is pretty much due south. In six months' time, it's the constellation Ophiuchus. With space rotating around the Sun once a year, Earth still has to pass through that space at 29.8 kilometers per second. It seems then that geocentritards haven't given their childish objections to Earth's motion much thought. There is a much more obvious and amusing problem, though. If the entire universe revolves around the Sun and is anchored to its motion so that it produces the annual variations that we observe, then by definition Earth is not the center of that universe, because the Sun is. Our seemingly simple fix to Brahe's universe makes it much more heliocentric than the real universe, the one that geocentrists think is a conspiracy against them, their sky fairy, and their holy books. In the face of modern observations about the cosmos, they have had to try and move the goalposts. Brahe's geo-helio bastard child of Ptolemy didn't cut the mustard, and now we have an entire universe revolving around the Sun. Surely, though, no geocentrists would actually be dumb enough to put forward such an obviously heliocentric universe and call it geocentric, would they? Here's one. It's Robert Sungenis, peddler of quote mining propaganda tatfest, The Principle. Brahe 2.0, or as he prefers to call it, the Neo Tuconian model, is essentially what he advocates as a geocentric universe. Of course, it still needs some amending, so we're not done yet. Remember the seasons, and how in reality they are explained simply by having Earth's axis tilted to its orbital plane. Luckily for us, Mr. Sungenis' extensive research into universal physics is in, and he has a geocentric explanation. The Sun, in the geocentric universe, moves vertically in an arc because the universe itself is oscillating back and forth in a 74 million mile margin. Since the Sun is held in the gravitational field of the universe, the Sun will likewise oscillate within the same 74 million mile margin, which turns out to be a maximum angle of 23.5 degrees if measured from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun. Hence, because the universe is spherical and oscillates accordingly, the Sun will move vertically, in an arc, obeying all the present laws of physics. See figure below. Yes, that's right, Sungenis' explanation isn't merely the crazy sun spiral that we saw in part one, where the Sun moves up and down due to some unspecified, unknown force. That would be silly. Sungenis' solution to that silliness is that it's the entire bloody universe that moves up and down by 74 million miles, for no apparent reason, due to some unspecified, unknown force. Hmm. As if moving the entire universe this way would somehow be easier than just moving the Sun. Here then we have Brahe 2.1. It has all the features of Brahe 2.0, but this time the entire universe bounces up and down once a year too. Unfortunately, whilst Sungenis claims that this universe obeys all the present laws of physics, he doesn't seem to get around to actually stating which laws of physics allow for the entire universe to oscillate by 74 million miles each year. Despite his usual affinity for quote mining to supposedly provide support for his batshit claims, Sungenis appears to be unable to draw on any external support for this one, despite claiming that there are unnamed geocentric scientists positing something he amusingly calls consensus geocentrism. Here's a quick heads up as to which laws of physics allow for the entire universe to move up and down once a year. Since Sungenis is claiming that the universe is spherical, that it all moves, and that the gravity of the universe holds the Sun in place, and since we know that on massive scales the universe is isotropic, then here we have confirmation that the Sun is at the center of his universe. 
As we saw earlier, it has to be in order for the CMB to exhibit an annual Doppler shift. There is apparently no limit to the stupidity of geocentrists in proposing a geocentric universe where the sun is at its centre. That's what happens when you try and retrofit reality into half-assed religious claptrap. So we're left with the inescapable conclusion that the desperate attempts of geocentrists to update their universe have no effect on it being absolute bollocks. Since Earth isn't even the centre of the geocentric universe anymore, leaving us all wondering if geocentritards really know what geo and centric actually mean in combination, we could just stop there. But we're not going to, because there's plenty more nonsense where that came from. In the next part, we'll continue to see why the neo Tuconian universe fails to polish the turd that is geocentrism. We'll see why the bouncing, spinning universe of Brahe 2.1 doesn't explain things as well as the likes of Sun Genis think it does, and why geocentritards who posit this model are disreputable liars who can't even manage to be internally consistent. See you then.